Hello everyone, I'm Nina Gopal. Welcome to Global Express. This is our interaction with experts to discuss developments in our backyard, in our immediate mm -hmm. neighborhood. This week, we're taking note of a very formal interaction that's taken place between India and Afghanistan last week in Kabul on March 8th. The Indian delegation, uh, which seemed to include a female official as well, was led by J.P. Singh, the Joint Secretary of Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran. The delegation met with former President Hamid Karzai. The delegation's main focus meet, I think, was with the Taliban Foreign Minister, Amir Khan Mutaki. And the carefully worded statement from the Ministry of External Affairs, uh, the Indian Mix Ministry of External Affairs, is this. Um, India stressed its interest in providing humanitarian assistance to the people of Afghanistan, medical assistance, provision of consular services to Afghan patients and students. And the Taliban government said much the same thing. Uh, Mr. Abdul Kahar Balki, the foreign office spokesperson, saying India wants to expand trade and economic ties and threw in the need for Chabahar port in Iran to be used by Afghan traders. So the immediate question that springs to mind is, what is the status of Indian investment in Chabahar? And far more importantly, are these the small, minute steps that India is taking before we formally recognize the government of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan? Will India redesignate the technical mission that we opened in Kabul in June 2022 as the Indian Embassy? I mean, we closed all our missions in August 2021. So it must be said that Mr. Singh's visit to Kabul is not the first time he's met Taliban officials. He met them before in Doha. And um, the U.S. Uh, special envoy, Zalmai Khalizad, is supposed to have played a role at that time. We don't know whether the U.S. is still pushing India or, or not. But what does India bring to the table? I mean, given that we have been in the forefront of education and healthcare in Afghanistan, particularly the girl, child, and women, since the time of the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. There are huge concerns worldwide over the Taliban's brutal crackdown and repression of women. And just last week on International Women's Day, uh, there were activists from Purple Saturdays Group, an organization set up to raise awareness uh, of women's rights. They held protests across the country with absolutely no avail. Today on our panel are three people who bring a very unique perspective to the table. Let me start by welcoming you, Mr. Sudhindra Kulkarni, who served as an aide to India's former Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee and is the founder of the Forum for a New South Asia, powered by India-Pakistan-China Cooperation. Now, in the second week of February, Mr. Kulkarni met the Taliban leader Suhail Shaheen in Doha. Uh, Suhail Shaheen heads the political office in the Qatari capital and is the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan's permanent representative to the UN. Welcome, Mr. Kulkarni. We're also pleased to welcome Mr. Samid Basin, a prominent writer and thinker on Afghanistan who's lived and operated multiple businesses in that country and is now seeking actively to forge better ties with the current dispensation. Welcome, Mr. Basin. Thank you. And a very, very special welcome to Ms. Hasina Shehjan. She is the president of Aid Afghanistan for Education, a non-profit group that has educated more than 3,000 Afghan girls. She had also headed Bumi, which is when I first met her, a Kabul-based decor outfit that used Afghan cotton. Born in Afghanistan, raised there and in the US, Ms. Hasina Shehjan returned home during Taliban rule and lived there until leaving again on the recent return of the Taliban. Welcome, Ms. Shehjan. Let's start with you, Mr. Kulkarni. What did you hope to achieve with your meeting uh, with Mr. Suhail Shaheen? What moved you to seek out such a meeting? Do you have official blessings from this present government, or is it your own personal initiative? And what was your biggest takeaway from that two-hour-long conversation that you were supposed to have had with him, where I think one of the key uh, points that you made uh, is that Mr. Shaheen's commitment to not allowing anyone to use Afghan territory to mount an attack on India uh, or its assets. That's kind of a sop, uh, considering, uh, you know, but we're not really rivals with Pakistan anymore. We've moved so far ahead. 
Please, uh, thank you, Nina. Uh, thank you, Nina, for uh, this opportunity to participate in an important discussion on an important country. Afghanistan uh, may not be our immediate geographical neighbor, but G Afghanistan is uh, a part of our civilizational neighborhood. We all belong to, whether it's Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Maldives, we all belong to one civilizational family. And we say, Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, you know, that was our motto at the G20 summit. Yeah. We should first revive mm -hmm. the idea of a family in our immediate geographical and civilizational neighborhood, which means that our ties with Afghanistan should be ties of a, of a family. And whenever a family member is, uh, is suffering, is having difficulties, it is our moral duty, duty as a family, and of course, duty as the, as the largest neighbor, as, as the largest country in the family, to help that member of the family. And it is from this perspective that I look at India-Afghanistan relations. Okay. Afghanistan really went through hell in the past uh, several decades. Four decades of continuous war. First, invasion by the Soviet Union. And then, invasion and occupation by the United States of America. In 2021, August, after a long, heroic battle, the Afghan people have driven out all the invaders just as they had, they had done in the past. And peace has more or less or gradually returned to Afghanistan. We may have you some have differences so, or the other. Do you think that, that's peace in, in the real terms? Yes, you know, it, it is certainly Afghanistan is moving towards internal peace. This is the first thing that we should recognize that mm. after, you know, uh, there is no civil war or anything coming close to a civil war in Afghanistan any longer. Afghanistan is moving towards national reconciliation and national reconstruction. And therefore, it is our duty as the largest country in this part of the world to stand alongside Afghanistan and help Afghanistan in every possible way. <clears throat> and since I have, uh, I have been working in my own individual capacity for uh, South Asian solidarity, I don't belong to any party now, but I believe that South Asia should come together and be made into a, la you know, a land, a zone of peace, cooperation, and shared prosperity. I took the initiative of going to Doha and meeting Tuhail Shaheen, who is the polit head of the political office of Taliban in Qatar. And he's also the designated representative of That's Afghanistan representative. in the United Nations. And I, was, right. I had a very constructive, uh, long conversation with Shaheen, which... I wrote as a, as a long article, a comprehensive article at the Quint recently. And I was very happy to hear from Shaheen. And he is not giving his personal opinion. This is the opinion. This is the view. This is a commitment by the Taliban. Two important commitments. First, that Afghanistan will not be used by anyone, will not be allowed to be used by anyone for terrorist activities, targeting India or any other country, not just, he made it clear, not just India or any other country. And therefore, this is truly new Afghanistan. The second, what about the second? The second is that the impression that the Taliban is pro-Pakistan and anti-India is wrong. We want to befriend India. We want to revive age-old relations with India so that you know we move in a in a completely new relationship of, of uh, mutual cooperation mutual friendship and this 
message needs to be heard by New Delhi loud and clear. It's a good thing, as you mentioned earlier, that New Delhi is now taking small but very meaningful steps towards befriending Afghanistan that is led by the Taliban. And it's all moving in the direction of eventual recognition, official recognition of the government in Afghanistan. So I think your heart is in the right place, Sudhindra, as always, even with the first initiative with Pakistan. But I think the reality is a little bit more difficult to uh, traverse. I, I'd like to bring in Mr. Basin and ask the critical question, can you, can we really, can India really trust the Taliban at this point? I mean, you've dealt with them. You saw the attack that happened on the Kabul em Indian embassy in Kabul in, uh, in uh, 2008. I remember visiting uh, shortly thereafter, you know, and there were multiple mm. attacks on Indian consulates and Indian, there was a threat to your uh, premises, if I remember, right? Uh, you know, uh, was it right across from you that there was some uh, a blast? Yes. And, and, and of course, in all the Indian consulates. So, uh, you know, the Taliban may be playing on India's, uh, you know, sort of soft spot, which is our ongoing enmity with Pakistan to score brownie points. Uh, you know, but they were an extension of the Pakistan army once. So can we safely um, assume that is over and take Mr. Suhail Shaheen at his word when he claims that, you know, that the Afghan soil will not be used when, when it's e even the attacks in Pakistan by the Tehreek-e Taliban, which are happening at the Pakistan uh, army installations and, uh, and on schools, even in Peshawar, are being conducted out of the border areas. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I uh, So firstly, uh, from Sudhinder ji, I take one point of the civilizational, uh, uh, civilize, we, you know, we are entering the geopolitical age of, I call it the, the clash of civilizations, you know, the, the broader East versus West civilization, taking a point from that, civilizationally, this region from, right from the British time has been one continent with, you know, ties. And I frame the Taliban more, some Afghans may not agree with me, but more on the historical perspective of, because they're largely Pashtuns and they're, they're, they have old ties with India and, and uh, you know, Pashtun Wali is an older thing and their real power lies in the, in the, in the chief chains and the Pashtun tribes, you know. Taliban is a recent phenomenon which emerged in 91, you know, and we all know the history of that. I will not get into that. Uh, as far as two points, as far as the attacks on India, we are we all know where those attacks came from. You know the common, That's right. common neighbor or common friend. Uh, Afghans are uh, very fiercely independent and uh, people with great pride. Okay, uh, Sina Jan is here. I know that there is a uh, she represents uh, 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 an. Uh, She's also an Afghan. So India's engagement with the Afghan has broadly been post the takeover of Taliban, been set up on a people to people level. Okay, and we are engaging, frankly, on both sides. And uh, because so there is that civil, there are multifaceted approach for India in terms of our people to people ties, and then the reality of. Uh, uh, the Pakistan and China factor, which also is a reality for us, is that if we do not engage with the current dispensation there, we lose out uh, space, you know. So I don't think the the Taliban, you know, uh, has had ties, their ties with Afghanistan, uh, with Pakistan have sort of transformed and we can see that in TTP, you know, they are not able to, I means they're all both sides, you know, they're not able to rein them in or they are, uh, you know, some sort of support within factions of Taliban for the TTP. So, and on counterterrorism, although the US in their agreement uh, signed that it would not attack, the actual wording is US or its allies. So, India is mm. not an ally of the US. As we are not an ally. Yeah. And I have what my interaction with the Taliban is that although they claim that they will not allow which uh, Sundarji clearly said, uh, you know, that's their line. They will not allow these terrorist groups to, uh, you know, use Afghan soil to stage attacks. But, uh, you know, in reality, I don't think they have the capacity to 
control that beyond a point. There are twenty. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. Mm-hmm. Actually, they do not. Yeah, they may. They don't have the manpower. Man. Yeah, no, they no, they're not only manpower because most of these factions stood alongside them during their uh, fight against the the erstwhile Afghan government and the U.S. forces. So you know, there there mm-hmm. are you know these are intricately connected uh, networks of. Or within uh, they have family relationships there other so it's not a, it's a right. complex area, you know so it is not very easy to to you know clearly clear that out that's their stated policy again and again <laughs> so I don't know how far that that will uh, uh, that will uh, they, they have the capacity to actually walk the talk you know so Thank every you. country that, every country including the Chinese including us deal with our with specific actors who are uh, a threat or a potential threat to us. So for India, it's the uh, the LET and Jaish e Mohammed and the ISKP and yeah. Chinese have their own and the Russians have their own players who they want. So every and Iran has its own issues. So we saw that what happened it's in Iran. Yeah, that's right. So that's right. I think that their intentions are right as far as strategically engaging with India. The last point is that. Uh, I was going through the statistics. Uh, there, 1920, the trade with India was uh, one and uh, before the takeover was about 1.5 billion dollars, where exports from India was a billion dollars, and 500 billion dollars was the imports from Afghanistan. Interestingly, the imports, the in- exports from India naturally have have for obvious reasons because of various factors. Uh, That's right. So That's current right. figures are around 750 million and. India is exporting 200 billion, but the imports from Afghanistan still continue to be at the old figure. Okay, mm. it the hasn't grown. Disruptions on Turkham and all that. So we are still as in 23, we imported, uh, which is largely spices, dry fruits, and fruits. Uh, that means hing and uh, and saffron is uh, is about 570 million dollars in imports India made, and we we still have we still honor the free trade. Uh, you know. Uh, zero duty regime which we had uh, signed with the previous administration so i think yeah. if i can if i can just uh, now go on to uh, hasina shahjan thank you very much hasina for agreeing to come on our show you've spent a lifetime now on empowering afghan women could you tell us a little bit about the aid afghanistan for education that you have started i mean if you could lay it out for us because what it was like dealing with the Taliban when you first came back to Afghanistan during Taliban rule in the 90s, what it was like then and what is it like now? I mean, then it was a sea of blue burqas, uh, stoning, beatings. Today, what is it like for women in Kabul and in the villages? They're still being beaten and stoned. And apparently they're being barred from uh, working even in government jobs. I mean, even in the NGOs and in the UN. So... Yet, at that time, you managed to create Bhumi. And now you've got this, can I call it, underground secret education centers. Would you please tell us what is it that makes you, you know, do this? Thank you, Nina. Thank you. It's great to see everyone and great to see you after many years. Um, I need to clarify something first. Um, I was not living in Afghanistan during the previous Taliban time. I I went there to visit for two weeks and I established some uh, clandestine secret school uh, classrooms for 250 yeah. girls. Um, and then I left. Um, so I moved back to Afghanistan in 2001, end of 2001. And then I was there for the last 20 years. Um, I really like this idea of being one big family, regional family. However, I think uh, whether Afghanistan is peaceful right now or not, it's something that we need to ask the Afghans who are living there. Um, mm, that's right. And I, I have stayed out of making political statements and I'm not even watching news anymore. <laughs> so and you said uh, that yes i know you have been saying that I, no we don't I, want a political I, I, statement we want our heartfelt we want to know but, how you feel so when we yes but so aid afghanistan for education 
was established uh, back then. In fact, in 1995, when I visited uh, refugee camps in Pakistan. Uh, and then uh, we, I, I registered the organization in Afghanistan in 2004, and we established a very unique program uh, of, of accelerated education for over 7,000 students. We ended up having 13 schools in nine provinces. It was incredible. And in fact, I just received an email from a, stu a graduate of ours who is now in the US and she is there with her husband and her kids and her father was working at a bakery in Afghanistan making $100 a month feeding 100, uh, 10, 10 family members and she got a job where she was making after she after she graduated from our program she went to American University of Afghanistan and her first job was paying her $900. Wow. So now she's in the US working and she said, I asked my father to stop working and I'm sending them money. So we have uh, many of these kind of, I mean, there are many uh, stories on our website, um, but um, in Afghanistan for education, um, office closed in Kabul after, <laughs> recent changes two years ago um and uh we are now working i'm not in, in afghanistan and but however we are working with private schools directly and we are enrolling street working mm -hmm. children into private schools in afghanistan where we so because these are private schools that they attend physically or they attend from yeah. home Yes, yes, physically. We we provide them with transportation, uniforms, books, lunch, and tutoring after uh, after their lunch. Um, and these are kids who are coming from most deprived families. And they're doing but are boys, mainly boys? These are girls and boys because they girls they and boys. Are they allowed yes. to sit in the same classroom or they segregate? First, first to sixth grade, yes. First to sixth grade, uh, they they can go to school and they're together. Um, at least in these schools that we are working with, they are together. There might be schools that yeah. they are separated. Now, uh, March 23rd, which is the first day of school year for the Afghans, um, and all the girls are eagerly waiting to see if they will be able to go back to school. I mean, banning mm. girls from education is definitely not Islamic. If it was Islamic, then all the Muslim countries should ban girls from going getting an education. So um, that's a very good uh, point. On that twenty third of March, we are having an online program. In fact, um, that anybody can join. The registration is online on our website, aidafghanistanforeducation.org, and um, we will be, you know, hearing from our students online. We have an online program as well for girls, because I believe that from difficult situations, we need to, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to see something different, to do something different, to be innovative. And um, education system in Afghanistan for the past 20 years, didn't really evolve very much, even though we we there was billions of dollars coming, and there were experts coming from Columbia University to um, to assist the Ministry of Education with curriculum and everything. But we still have the same old curriculum. We're basically uh, producing robots. It's the mm -hmm. system is the road system of education. Everybody is memorizing. <laughs> So yeah, I, yeah. this whole this situation now is is an opportunity. So we are actually having online classes for girls, and they're doing extremely well. The online classes are only for English and computer because I believe that if they speak and write good English and they know what to do with computer, they can get an online degree anywhere. They can join. Um, so Han this is this, the cutoff age, uh, Hasida Jan, is then eight to twelve. I mean, no, would they be, this uh, is the age from uh, 
from uh, six to 12 or our street working children that are going to private schools. For girls who are banned from going to school, uh, these are students who are at home now, they were in high school or they were at university. Uh, you can so you see give them, you, you're helping them as well. Online, yes, where they're yeah. now learning uh, computer programming, which will allow them to actually work online. Uh, we purchase computers for them and we provide them with internet access. So and there this, no this, is, this, has the, this is being done with the full knowledge of the authorities or is it under the radar? They have no, they have no way of controlling this. It's online. Mm -hmm. And we, our, our teachers are great volunteers, Afghans who grew up in Canada and they are, they're university students actually, but they're really good and they're very committed and they're there every day uh, teaching. And so Fantastic. it's going really well, yes. If, if I can just move to you, Mr. Kulkarni, on something you said, you said that Suhail Shaheen sort of indicated that there would be some kind of rethink going on within the Taliban on giving women a place in society. I mean, I've, I've always wondered, don't the Taliban have mothers, sisters, nieces? So a rethink. Does that mean that women will be allowed to go back to work, uh, walk on the streets, use public spaces uh, without a mahram? I mean, Saudi Arabia has changed, uh, but the Taliban, are they still going to go in the opposite direction? I mean, what is the indication, that signal that he gave you? The, <clears throat> my conversation with uh, Suhail Shaheen, the head of the political office of Taliban in Qatar, gave me a very distinct understanding that Taliban is now becoming more pragmatic. It is not mm -hmm. Taliban of uh, the late 90s when they first captured power in mm -hmm. Kabul. Mm -hmm. They committed many mistakes and some of the mistakes are continuing even now. But the Taliban is certainly changing. It may not be changing as fast as even Afghanistan's own friends might like but it is changing. And I am very confident that in the years to come, if the international community stays engaged in a constructive manner, we will see many positive reforms in Afghanistan. And I was very happy to hear from our sister Hasina the efforts that uh, Afghan women are doing, Afghan women within Afghanistan and also Afghan women who are outside Afghanistan to help women in Afghanistan. You know, we must recognize, Nina, that uh, Afghan women have played a very vital role in, in defeating mighty external forces, be it the Soviets or Americans and NATO forces later. Without Afghan women's participation, Afghanistan would not have been free as it is today. They have silently suffered so many hardships. And many of these hardships are not even known to the rest of the world. For example, today there are one, nearly one million widows, war widows and orphans. They need to be helped. There are 850,000 disabled people in Afghanistan, right. they need to be helped. And whose responsibility is it? First of all, it is the responsibility of the countries who, you know, who, who are responsible for all that happened, for the destruction, deaths. At least now they should do Pashchatta, as we say in India. They should repent. repent. They should repent their crimes and come to the help of Afghan people. But, you know, it's not only really their responsibility. What about India? India is the largest country in the region. And we say that it's part of our civilizational family. Now, India is the largest in terms of population, the most populous nation in the world. We take pride in saying that we are soon going to become the third largest economy in the world. India is a prosperous nation. 
we should help Afghanistan in every possible way. You know, several yes, in, fact, in, in fact, Mr. Shaheen did tell you that uh, that his sole focus was going to be reconstruction. You know, and that they want positive ties with all the all the all the countries in the region. You are right, Nina, and that's why you see. You know, some decades ago, India built a hospital for children in Kabul. Yes, I remember India the Indira Gandhi hospital. hospital. Yes, and it, in, and it brought in 1985 so for India. But the need of Afghan Afghan people is enormous, and therefore. Through this program, Nina, I would like to convey a message to all the philanthropic organizations in India. Mm. The Tatas, the Birlas, the Ambanis and all of them. Why don't they look for opportunities to do humanitarian service of enduring nature in Afghanistan? Why don't they go and build hospitals there? Why don't they start initiatives that create livelihood opportunities, opportunities for the disabled people to be rehabilitated. Why should only Western NGOs work in Afghanistan? How many Indian mm. NGOs are working in Afghanistan? So now is the time. You know, you began your program by saying that the Indian government through the Joint Secretary had this meeting with the Foreign Minister of Afghanistan, Mr. Amir Khan Muttaki, and one of the main issues discussed was humanitarian aid. Now, let this be a very big component of India-Afghan engagement. We are in a position to do so. We can build 10 different, 10 bigger hospitals in Afghanistan. We can send hundreds, in, indeed thousands of teachers to Afghanistan. We can do so much work in agriculture. We can do so much work even in stopping narcotics. You see, narcotics is a big menace in Afghanistan. And it is, it is really uh, a menace for India also. So there has to be an international campaign against narcotics, which will help Afghanistan rebuild itself. Yeah, so, because the Taliban the have destroyed, the, destroyed the poppy cultivation Completely. Yes, they have banned poppy cultivation, yeah. which means that they, now the farmers of Afghanistan need to be given alternatives Absolutely. to earn livelihood for themselves. And yeah. the last point I would like to make, Nina, is <clears throat> uh, Samir Basinji made a very important point in saying that the Afghan people are proud people, they are brave, they are independent-minded. They have never bowed before any external force. The mightiest forces in the world, in the past, and also in modern times, have failed to to, them. to to make the Afghans submissive. Now, you know, there may not be 100% peace. That is not my claim, but peace is gradually returning. And therefore, it is the responsibility of the international community and especially the regional countries, which includes India, Pakistan, China, Iran, Russia, all of us to work together, not to, you know, not to uh, stop some others, not to play games. We should, we should show that all of us are working together for reconstruction, reconstruction, reconstruction of Afghanistan and not for gaining any kind of a strategic advantage against some other neighbor, some okay. other force. So if I can just go to uh, Mr. Sami Basin, uh, you know, you did say uh, that, that, I mean, sorry, Surya Shaheen in his interview did say that India is dragging its feet on normalization. You know, what, is that a tacit sort of signal that uh, he wants... Uh, you know, a, a recognition of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. Do you think that's where it's headed? Are these the small, small steps that are being taken, as I asked before, towards uh, normalization? And, uh, you know, uh, I, I really would like to know uh, where it's going. I mean, they, they've asked us to, uh, to also help with reconstruction, which means we've already built the the Parliament House, we've built Selma Dam, we've built the Saranj Dalaram Highway, 
uh, you know, uh, there, there is, I think, another dam on the Amur River, which is which they would like built. Uh, so what what is this all adding up to? So, Nina, see, uh, let's be very clear. Uh, till the U.S. does not move on what the term recognition, okay, they hold the keys still, okay. And I don't think any country with the complications of the sanctions and, and you know, because they are actually uh, still have some people on the sanction list. So they are, but everyone is dealing with them like India and calling them like the UN uh, special representative of the, like the de facto, the word is being used as de facto administration. So you are without giving them formal recognition, playing in a space and engaging with them. Everyone is actually. But right. I, the Chinese, everyone has done it in different ways. So the I think that the most uh, aggressive have been the Chinese by accepting an ambassador and the credentials, uh, you know. But the others are basically, uh, you know, still growing and engaging at different levels. So I don't see a, a very quick, neither will India do it, nor in fact, even Pakistan has not done it. Uh, and nor have, like in Taliban 1.0, now UAE, Saudi, who had recognized the Taliban, none of them have done it this time. So I don't no, see also, that happening. If you don't mind me interrupting, a, a recognition would also mean that the embassies would have to be functioning embassies in the sense they would be issuing visas. And uh, right now that hasn't happened. So no, the, the, the visas are, are a, a huge problem, aren't they? For no, so Afghan Indian students Indian. who live here. Yeah, that is a big issue because we, for whatever reasons known best known to the policy makers, suddenly, you know, we were giving a thousand, at times, thousand visas a day just from the best in Kabul. And I, as Air India, GSA, I'm aware of the numbers, you know, because I was involved in that business. And my office, as you said earlier, was across the road before it got bombed in the 2008 attack. But that has suddenly been completely stopped. So I roughly, the numbers I have is we have issued 200 visas, probably in that number since the last, you know, since August 15, 21. And we have unfortunately even cancelled the visas we already issued. So I met some people mm. in Turkey who had been issued visas just before August 15th and even, you know, those were cancelled. So, you know, that is, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a policy decision. I cannot comment. There are various reasons for that. But to my mind, it's, you know, if you have to do people to people ties with Afghans, then when I come back to Sinajan, if we engage with Afghanistan, when we say people, it's people of Afghanistan, whether in or outside of Afghanistan. Okay, India is very clear on that. Okay, but the fact is that if we had the op option of, of uh, you know, uh, with due respect, appeasing the people outside and not engaging with Afghanistan, that was not a realistic, you know, it would not be very pragmatic to do that because that would achieve nothing. You know, while engaging. We are, you know, involved in humanitarian aid because there are roughly, I don't know the number, but the figures are around 40 million Afghans still living in Afghanistan. And, uh, and, and as you rightly said, the Afghans are now wanting us to, and uh, Sudhinderji also said that, is to ele elevate our, uh, the issue is not of recognition really, because they understand that that cannot happen, you know, but uh, they will also still put it on at a discussion point, but it cannot happen without the West really coming on. Even Russia is not doing without, it. Without recognition, also there can be no functioning embassy, which will, no, so which will allow, embassy, no, so allow students in India to continue to live here and, uh, you know, offer health, uh, health uh, you know, uh, services. I mean, so many of the uh, Afghans who came to India basically came for health care and they can't come here anymore. No, no, no. So that is, that is an administrative decision. We had decided after August 15th, actually on 17th of August, I remember clearly India had opened e-visas. Okay. But then they, they did not actually, you know, pursue it. But we have mechanisms of issuing e-visas or, or using our <laughs> upgrading our technical mission in Kabul uh -huh. or upgrading what we call is our technical mission in Kabul to issuing visas. So that we can issue. Like the Afghans issue visas on arrival, we can do an e-visa you know, taking care of yeah. the security concerns. That is not a. If I can just, uh, if I can just go back, go back to Hasina Jan. 
uh, you know, I, w- I was uh, curious about one thing about the educational facilities that you are, you know, uh, giving people, uh, you know, uh, especially girls above the age of 12. Uh, does that include uh, university level as well? Because Afghan universities, you know, churned out so many women uh, who were, uh, you know, employed across the country. I mean, we went to Kabul. It was uh, a sight for sore eyes to see, you know, women on the streets and, uh, you know, in the ministries and so on and so forth. So, firstly, where does the funding come from to get this done? Is it also, uh, are these schools and, uh, you know, do they go up to the university level and or are the girl child and the boys having to leave uh, Afghanistan? Because I also hear that the number of madrasas are consciously uh, being increased and the treatment of uh, there's a very scandalous story in uh, Radio uh, Europe uh, Liberty or uh, whatever that channel is called which talks about the sort of maltreatment uh, you know of young boys at these uh, madrasas bordering on you know on predat- predat- predatory behavior um, so I I would like to say that as far as recognizing this regime or investment right now, I think everything needs to be contingent on education of girls and and working. Working, yes, they and, and the private schools that we're working with, um, majority and all of the, the teachers are women, but women cannot be leading. <laughs> an NGO and they cannot work in the UN and so very limited um, and I, the government I don't know um, but as far as our program uh, the uh, from the street to classroom program is mostly right now for girls and boys who are on the streets and they're between six and ten years old they're selling plastics oh cans or bagging or um, scavenging and, and trash oh. so we place them in private schools with the hope mm-hmm. in first grade with the hope that by the time they reach sixth grade, there will be a change. Um, as mm. far as our online classes, they are for girls who are banned from education right now. They're either in high school or university, but we are not teaching a full curriculum of high school. Right. Or we're basically equipping them with good English and computer skills so yes, that yes. they will be able to reach out um, to international uh, universities, or uh, they might even be able to get a certificate from Khan Academy. And I'm sure that some of the uh, universities, uh, international universities, will give uh, scholarships and a special, uh, a special uh, entrance for. Uh, Afghans because they know that they cannot continue their education in Afghanistan. So do you see it? Do you see it progressing in the uh, in the months and years ahead, uh, also under the Taliban radar, to include older 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 girls? I, I would, would, no that be, would that be a plan? Hopeful. I'm I'm only hopeful that there will be a change. However, this change will be, I have no idea. So that. Um, on the 23rd of March, we will have our, our online students will be speaking in our program actually. And um, they, um, that, that they, they cannot, it's just, it's impossible. It, you cannot uh, develop a country or a population cannot go on like this with, with girls and women sitting at home. They are That's mostly, and they're, they're suffering from severe depressions. And most of yes. our yes. Yeah, I'm certain. I'm certain. Mr. Pukami, would you uh, would you be open to uh, be the voice uh, that actually advocates, you know, as, is, the, is the main advocate for uh, you know a greater freedoms in in uh, in Afghanistan for the people, uh, you know, uh, and I mean also the the whole Indian uh, you know. Um, relationship with Afghanistan uh, when uh, Mr. Kar- when President Karzai was there and when Dr. Abdullah was the uh, foreign minister was with a very progressive 
uh, multi sort of uh, group, you know, in the sense they didn't, uh, it was both Pashtun and uh, Hazara and Tajik, of course, predominantly Tajik. Uh, but somehow we seem to have abandoned the uh, that Tajik component uh, to a great extent. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'd like Sam to come in as well on this, but you know, we've abandoned our relationship with the uh, Northern Alliance. I mean, there's a very, very smart young man who's uh, inheritor of uh, his father's legacy, Ahmad Shah Masood's legacy, Ahmad Masood. But, you know, it's all been frittered away uh, in the sense that there is no one cohesive political opposition now. And India is refusing to touch them with a barge pole. So, you know, there's nobody to actually, the, there's no sane sensible voice which says we have to do this to get our people back, uh, you know, and give them a better environment. Uh, Nina. Would you be, would you, can you be that voice, Mr. Kolkani? See, uh, we must recognize the truth that Afghanistan is multi-ethnic. Just as right. India is multi-religious and this diversity must be recognized diversity must be celebrated any effort by the majority to impose its own will on minority whether in india in pakistan or afghanistan is ultimately going to be counterproductive therefore afghanistan therefore must move in the direction of national reconciliation in which every ethnic group feels that they have a stake, that Afghanistan belongs to all. Now, in this context, India must not, India of that matter, any other regional country or outside country must not play favorites. That is, we are close to one group which is fighting against another group. That must stop. Instead, we should encourage as friends of Afghanistan, we should encourage all of them to work together, which is in the best interest of Afghanistan and Afghanistan's future. Having said this, Nina, I would also like to say one thing that has not so far uh, appeared in our discussion so far, and that is that we should really look to the enormously bright future that Afghanistan has and the en entire South Asia has. After having gone through hell, the people of Afghanistan have become enormously resilient. They are strong. They are intelligent. They have faced adversities. And therefore, with peace, they can do wonders. Afghanistan is blessed with rich natural resources. For example, they, are, they have huge deposits of natural gas. Which they cannot they do, which they cannot use only themselves. They also have very rich minerals, including yeah. rare earths. Then Afghanistan is also well placed to provide connectivity to India, to Central Asia, and further to Eurasia. You know the, that's right. So the international you know, North mentioned North earlier North. the Chabar port. In Iran, we are already building that port. We need to accelerate we? that. Mm. We should build the railway line connecting Chabar port to Afghanistan, which will That's give true. connectivity because Afghanistan is a landlocked country, which That's will right. give us connectivity to go to Afghanistan Central bypassing Asia. Pakistan. Of course, if Pakistan gives us the access to Afghanistan, that's the best that's the best thing to happen but we should accelerate the construction of the chabar port and the connectivity and further take that connectivity to the rest of central asia even I china think, i think we should i think we should bring sam in on this mr samir basin because he has visited chabahar and i think he knows a little bit more about chabahar than he lets on Okay, Do so tell us uh, where we are placed on it. So I will start with your question. See, you have to define 
what we earlier started when the talks when the us agreement taliban agreement was concluded 29th february 2020 okay mm -hmm. and 15th september if i am correct 2020 uh, that was during covid second phase of covid the intra afghan talks started you know so that's right we know we all know where they went as my understanding is you have to define inclusivity and rights of people when you get into the terminology of political inclusivity I, i'm sorry to say we we have all those friends but uh, they have by now lost their they may not like this uh, as far as the taliban is concerned their political lost relevance, their relevance yes as you saw in the uh, the un uh, uh, organized in qatar the talks on i think it was recently around the 18 19 okay no, the taliban yeah. didn't turn up there for this reason that it really shows that they said they are the only stakeholders and they do not recognize anyone else in the political space so you have to basically this is this is a reality frankly because we can blame whoever you know the us or whoever uh, we want to but that's the reality today that you have to like kulkar kal kal kulkarni ji really said that you have to define that india's role as bringing people together is to protect rights of minorities as he also talked about india in terms of our religious diversity and the right of minorities there also the right of minorities should be protected but if we are expecting that the old political elite of kabul are going to get a political space i i doubt that will happen and it will basically be a new leadership may emerge and uh, uh, both because they are still forming the cons new constitution and how you protect the rights of the of the minorities under the constitution will have to be seen because they will follow a certain form of islam uh, anafi islam and how do you protect so on on the chabahar port could you just on give us an update on what the situation is the chabahar port uh, uh, external affairs minister visited iran as you know recently which was triggered by the houthi attacks on indian vessels but <laughs> in khabar port we he signed a long term framework agreement although president ghani and uh, prime minister modi and the uh, president of iran signed the agreement in 2016 uh, it's a tripartite agreement on chabar port so chabar port has to has uh, opportunity but it has a major uh, problem also which is basically the us so we have signed the 10 uh, year framework which chabar it's 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 one terminal it is a shahid basti terminal uh, on chabar port and uh, which we are developing i have been there many times uh, three times in all Hello. i was actually there on chabar day when balakot happened uh, in, on, mm. in so uh, you know the us sanctions create because what the world doesn't understand i was recently at a closed door meeting with the armenians so they are also looking at developing even iran wants to do that is to developing because of this geopolitical uh, tensions in the world to develop the as uh, uh, kulkarni sahab also mentioned is to develop alternate routes to uh, the ins chabar is part can is part of the ins tc so it not only is access to central asia but it is also access to uh, to the caucasus region and beyond europe europe yes. and, and russia Eurasia. but the biggest impediment in that is that um, uh, the sanctions no one i remember when i went to chabar they had offered this is way back in 2019 uh, afghans 50 acres of free land but no afghan would go and set up shop there because there were some who were doing small businesses but because of uh, you know issues with sanctions because no one you know th that is a very complex thing although the chabar port as they use the word the us uses the word cow out they have carved out the investment in the chabar port and exempted it from sanctions but the chabar port itself is not exempt from sanctions so that is and and just to add us is going into elections and guess what if mr trump comes back to power then you know it will change the whole dynamics of the us iran relationships and guess that's right you know does anybody is guess will happen so you know there so, is so there is a lot of interest but you know it is the complexity the only impediment biggest impediment is the us sanctions so basically mr kulkarni and mr basin both of you agree that india should pursue 
uh, you know, uh, opening up opportunities to do business with the Taliban. Am I right? Yes. Yeah, I would no. like to make one additional point, Nina, with your permission. Yeah, sure. That uh, it is in Afghanistan's own interest and India should work in that direction that Afghanistan creates an environment conducive to the return of the minority, religious minorities. And I mean especially the Afghan Hindus and Afghan Sikhs. They may have been small in number, but they have been living in Afghanistan for centuries. And because of the disturbed conditions, many of them have left Afghanistan. In fact, Afghanistan if I can just welcome say them back. You know, in and in fact, sure. Mr. Kulkarni, in 2001, one of the first places I visited was the Sikh Gurudwara. And these guys had buried whatever they had, uh, they could, down deep down on the earth, you know, so that it would not have got destroyed by the Taliban, which was yeah. which had marked yellow crosses on all the houses yeah. where the Hindus and Sikhs had lived. So, you know, there all, were targets. All that must change. Afghanistan, the Taliban must ensure that the religious freedoms of Hindus and Sikhs and others, Buddhists, are protected. No more crimes like the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddha, which was a crime oh, yeah. against humanity. All this must stop for Afghanistan. And the bomber who blew himself up in the, and the bomber who blew himself up in the Sikh Gurdwara recent uh, two years ago. So there, this is a big, big problem. If I can, I, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to uh, end with uh, Hasina Jan. Uh, please tell me, you know, the protesters that went across uh, the, on International Women's Day, uh, there was one placard which said, our silence is the biggest weapon of the Taliban. Why is the world, you think, silent? I mean, on, on the Taliban, uh, you know, attitude towards women. What is it that keeps them silent? I mean, we all know that Afghanistan is important, uh, you know, uh, economically it must, it, it has to have a, you know, a, a place in society and all that. But should they not, uh, you know, India and all of these countries being uh, sort of being asked to do business with the Taliban, but ignoring and putting the brutal treatment of uh, girl, the girl, child and women to one side. Is that right? That's a very good question, actually. The world is being silent on many things going on in Afghanistan. But um, as I said before, um, in a way, I, I think the, the US uh, sanction is also one of the conditions of removing the sanction is the treatment of women in Afghanistan at the moment. Um, so I don't think that they're being totally silent. Uh, however, I don't know, maybe there are meetings behind the scene uh, that we don't know. I mean, there's there are still meetings taking place in Qatar. Um, it, it's, well, it's the UN a, special reporter, on uh, he made a call on International Women's Day. He said that all women who are being held arbitrary in jail without just cause should be released. He did make that comment, you know. So it it is it is a big Thomas, issue. Is you know, I think we we need to see some actions if this group wants to be recognized, or we need we need to see. You know, it's not enough for their representative to say that we are different now. This is a different Taliban than before. We need to see some actions. We, we need to, before we even encourage any country to go and make investments, we, oh, there needs to be... To, can I switch, switch off that call? I don't want to lose them. They need, there needs to be uh, um, an obvious mm -hmm. and, and uh, some, some, can, some changes. Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I hope no, no, be. I, I, I think it's easier when it's another country. You know, I don't know what what would have India do if there is a government that says all women should stay home now. Yeah, you know? I know exactly. <laughs> it won't happen. 
<laughs> I mean, in fact, a, the women, have, the number of women who vote that Afghanistan is the only doubled. country in the world with this condition, you know? Yeah. So yes. um, it's, um, I mean, it's before anything else. It's really, we, we need to remove this mindset and this condition in Afghanistan before we can even think of anything. Of course, you know, the dire situation of economic situation and people are suffering. I mean, we also distribute food items to our students' families every month. Um, mm. Well uh, done, I'm very proud of you. I'm very proud to call you my friend, Hasina. Fantastic, you. really. Do you have a concluding remark to make, Mr. Kolkadi? Would you like to say something? No, uh, just this. First of all, thank you, Nina, for a debate on Afghanistan. We should have more and more and more such debates in the mainstream Indian media about Afghanistan and with a positive perspective. Of course, Absolutely. We, should, we should not uh, be blind to the wrong things that are happening in Afghanistan, but in totality, the situation in Afghanistan is improving. And it is our duty to engage Afghanistan on multiple fronts as the largest country in South Asia so that we take the lead in changing the destiny of South Asia, make it a zone of peace, prosperity, and harmony in the most populous region in the world. Thank you. Mr. Basim, would you like to conclude? Please unmute yourself. Unmute. Taking on from Mr. Kulkarni, I would, you know, not say improving. I would say there is relative peace, but there are issues to be addressed. But like he rightly said, that we have to engage, we have to address concerns, which Sina Jan really said, you know, because. You cannot expect half the population to be their freedom and their uh, more than half. Yeah, to more be in a half, country yeah. to be curtailed and and the country to go on this way. Uh, we should continue to engage and you know sort of help the Taliban. Uh, you know uh, address those issues while so it's the economic, social, political factors. It's not that it's one or the other. It should the engagement should constantly not you know avoid i mean uh, neglect that issue but continue to address that issue but while keeping on engaging with them to keep you know address all these issues maybe engaging with pakistan would help engaging pakistan oh, now is, is not that relevant <laughs> scenario, frankly <laughs> no, but you have thousands of refugees She's absolutely right about that point because if these refugees who've lived in, in Pakistan for all these years are being shunted back into Afghanistan, the demographic could also change. The number of, you know, the, the particular demographic could then balance itself in such a way that the Taliban would probably benefit. Who knows? And also, I think they listen to Pakistan more, you know. If Pakistan put some pressure on allowing girls to go back to school, then I think they would do it immediately. Mm. That's very good. Thank you very much. I will leave you all with this one question. Should the international community engage with the Taliban, which uses fear and intimidation, or should it use a charm offensive, you know, to persuade the Taliban to see a, a better way for its people? Thank you, Mr. Kulkarni. Thank you, Mr. Thank Basin. You. And thank, thank you, you. Hasina Jat. It was wonderful having all of you on the program. Thank, thank you. you.